So I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and then I'll pass it over to Nick LaLuc to introduce our speaker. The archeological research facility is located in Pichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chechenya speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and, Verona, and Verona, sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all American Indian and Indigenous peoples. So with that, I'd like to um, invite Nick Maluk to introduce our speaker. Great, great. Thank you, Nico. Um, yeah, so Joseph Aguilar is an enrolled member of the San Ildefonso Pueblo in New Mexico and currently serves as archaeologist with the Bering Straits Native Corporation and is also the Pueblo's Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Um, Dr. Aguilar completed his PhD from the Department of Anthropology at University of Pennsylvania and his general research interests include indigenous archaeology, museums, landscape archaeology, and tribal historic preservation. He is currently working on an exhibit and <clears throat> content development for several museums, including the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, the De Young Museum of Art in San Francisco, and the Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum at Mesa Verde National Park, and for the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And want everybody to join me in welcoming Dr. Aguilar to our talk today. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for having me. Um, and thank you to Nick Laluk for making this happen and the folks at uh, the ARF uh, for, for hosting me. Um, I wish I could have done this in person. Uh, like many of you, I'm sure you guys have I've missed other commitments um, in person. So maybe one day I'll get back out there, uh, I hope. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm just gonna talk uh, very briefly about uh, some of the work I've been doing as it relates to the archeology span of the Pueblo Revolt here um, in my home Pueblo of New Mexico. And um, before I go further, uh, Patrick Naranjo, uh, Thanks for uh, acknowledging me and my work. Uh, it's good to, to see and know that um, there's some Pueblo folks and other indigenous folks out there at Berkeley. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, good knowing that and, and thanks for your words. Um, so, so my work for my dissertation um, at the University of Pennsylvania focused on uh, the historical and um, Kind of anthropological history of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 and its aftermath. Um, I chose to 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 study the revolt um, as it relates to my own home community of San Ildefonso Pueblo, where I'm calling from now, because it was a it's a pivotal um, point in Pueblo history. Um, many of the uh, events that occurred during that period. Um, have direct effects and consequences on contemporary Pueblo people today. Uh, so it, it's it was um, important for me to to kind of dive in into that history and offer a new perspective on the revolt because what we've been presented with uh, was very one sided. Um, it was void of any indigenous voices, um, and I felt we needed to remedy that. So I did it in my way um, by bringing archaeology, a uh, critical review of uh, ethno-historic records, um, and incorporating um, indigenous worldviews, uh, including oral histories, into this work. So combining those, those kind of disparate uh, components of the past uh, was a challenge, but I, I did my best. And so I'll present some of the results of my work and where I hope to be headed with um, uh, with my work in the future. Um, so like, like I mentioned in, in our communities, we, we learn about our, 
our history, our, our histories in, in different ways, um, non-Western ways, if you will. Um, and outside of our communities, we learn about our history uh, through schools, museums, um, popular books. Uh, and this is taught to us by um, anthropologists, archaeologists, popular writers, um, almost all of whom are non pueblo people. So my work, like I said, is informed by my own traditional values. Um, and academic discourse. So all of this is kind of founded by the tenets of the burgeoning field of indigenous archaeology. Um, and I, I view the Pueblo Revolt, um, uh, which was an indigenous insurrection against European settler colonialism, colonialism as an assertion of uh, indigenous sovereignty. Um, so the overarching goal of my work is to present an indigenized um, anthropological history of events surrounding this era. Um, and I use the term indigenized specifically rather than uh, decolonized um, because the events that I'm, I'm analyzing this, you know, this, this uh, period of, um, of Pueblo uh, revolution in 1680 from about 1680 to 1696. That was, to me, in, in my view, was a truly um, decolonizing event. It was necessarily violent, um, but in my view, uh, those actions and the, the course of actions that were taken by public people then were truly decolonial. Um, so. I choose to use indigenized because I'm not ready, I'm not equipped, I'm not totally prepared to, to decolonize archaeology or museums or whatever else I engage myself in, um, because those are really drastic actions. And we can chat more about that later if we want. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with a, a quick slideshow. Um, And I hope this works. We were trying to work out the kinks in this in the, before we came on. Everybody see this? Okay, good. Yes, it looks good. Okay, cool. So this um, mesa here that you see, I mean, and it's just outside my window here. Um, if I could pick up my computer and put the camera out here, you'd, you'd see this mesa. Uh, we refer to this mesa as Tunio. In the table language, it's uh, one of the four um, cardinal mesas surrounding um, our Pueblo. Um, so in Pueblo cosmology, um, the direction, four directions, six directions are, for, are important, and this mesa marks the north um, for our Pueblo. Um, and it's an it's a impos imposing place. It's a spiritual place. It's a beautiful place um, and it's in my backyard. So this work is very near and dear to me um, uh, for these reasons. So uh, founding this work um, uh, at, at, the, at the foundation of a lot of the work that, that I do um, are indigenous and collaborative archeologies. span um, the decolonizing mission uh, set forth by indigenous archaeology is a response to the colonial frameworks that continue to deeply influence institutions of knowledge and power. So at stake for indigenous peoples in this endeavor are the inherent right to control and contribute to the production of knowledge about our cultures and histories, the inherent right to protect, preserve, and present our heritage on our terms and the inherent right to present our own accounts of our history and our past. Um, at the core of this mission is the recognition that uh, as a Western scientific practice, archaeology doesn't hold a monopoly on understanding the past um, and that archaeology can benefit from engaging with non-Western, um, i.e. indigenous peoples and perspectives. 
So although collaborative and indigenous archaeologies both advocate interaction with stakeholder values, knowledge, practices, ethics, and sensibilities, they differ on one central point. Uh, collaborative archaeology is defined as a range of strategies that seek to link the archaeological enterprise with different publics by working together. In contrast, indigenous archaeology um, identifies and privileges a very specific public, um, which is indigenous peoples. Um, so indigenous archaeology is not a single idea, but rather a broad approach that incorporates a diverse array of indigenous ontologies, practices, and peoples. Uh, accordingly, indigenous archaeology is highly contextual with the goals, methods, and outcomes of interaction di differing across tribal communities. So for example, my way of, of uh, practicing or promoting indigenous archaeology will vary um, and differ from, say, Nick Laluk's way of um, doing uh, a form of indigenous archaeology. So um, some of the foundations of indigenous archaeology, um, it's, it's rooted in, in some forms of uh, Native American activism. Uh, Joe Watkins, a Choctaw archaeologist, um, states that archaeology is the study of people, not things, and that these people have a present and a future as well as a past, and that archaeologists must integrate the concerns of the American Indian people with their research. Um, what Watkins is essentially calling for is a fundamental shift in the way that archaeologists operate. And um, he published his, his volume um, back in 2000. So um, it's, it's relatively a recent trend, a recent uh, movement within archaeology, uh, but it's gaining momentum. Um, so instead of, in, instead of viewing indigenous people as objects, uh, archeologists must acknowledge that native people are living people with a unique set of complex histories and identities. Um, in this sense, archeologists must begin to think of themselves as working with Indian people instead of working on Indian people. Underlying indigenous critiques of archaeology and the formulation of indigenous and tribal archaeologies are the writings of Vine Deloria Jr. Um, in his book, Custer Died for Your Sins, uh, he articulates um, native sovereignty um, and very kind of bluntly uh, rejects the colonial project of archaeology and anthropology. One of the greatest contributions of his work um, is his ability to articulate the distaste that many Native people have felt for the pretenses of uh, science. Um, Deloria's primary objection to the anthropological study of Indigenous people is that historically, there's been no ethical relationship between the subject and the scientist. Uh, for Deloria, the meticulous gathering of anthropological knowledge um, is detached from the plight of its subjects. Um, and I like using his quote there that the compilations of useless knowledge for knowledge's sake should be utterly rejected by the Indian people. Um, because for, for much of the history of the discipline of um, archaeology, there's been no benefit to uh, Native people. Um, and it's Native people themselves who have kind of turned the tables within the discipline. So I, I like turning to Deloria for some of his critiques of archaeology. So as it applies to the Pueblo Revolt of uh, 1680, um, I'd like to see, I'd like to um, discuss a little bit how the foundations of indigenous archeology, span the tenets of indigenous activism, how they apply to the work that I'm doing. Um, but first I'll begin with a kind of brief uh, summary of the revolt of 1680. Uh, it's aftermath and uh, some of the ongoing kind of historical um, effects of the revolt. Um, so this quote here is a quote from uh, Pedro Naranjo of uh, Santa Clara Pueblo, as recorded uh, by Governor Antonio Oderman, who was the territorial governor of um, New Mexico in 1680. Um, many of his journals have been translated by um, Hackett and Shelby um, at the University of New Mexico from 
um, Spanish into uh, English. And so a lot of my work is based on the translations of those journals themselves. Um, but as I mentioned before, you know, these, these sources are one sided, very biased, void of public voices. Nonetheless, they still provide an important um, resource for kind of uh, broad um, kind of historical facts, I mean, historical uh, interpretations of this period. Um, so I like using this quote um, in 1680, um, Oderman refers uh, to Pope as coming down in person, ordering uh, the Pueblos through which he passed that they instantly break up and burn the images of the Christ, the Virgin Mary, the other saints, the crosses and everything pertaining to Christianity, uh, that they burn the temples and break up the bells. Again, a true act of uh, decolonization. Um, so, so while the the initial act of six of the public revolt in 1680, the the uprising um, is well known um, uh, in the kind of annals of history, what is lesser known is the attempts at reconquest uh, after the revolt. Um, there were several um, failed attempts at reconquest. Um, and in one case, um, Vargas, who was the, uh, the, the person to lead one of the major efforts at reconquest for the, for the uh, crown of Spain, um, he, led, he led a couple um, expeditions into New Mexico to reclaim uh, the former territory of, uh, of New Mexico. Um, at one point, he took ritual possession of New Mexico um, he toured the Pueblos where he was cautiously greeted uh, where he prom and where he promised a new peaceful era of Pueblo uh, and Spanish um, cohabitation in the region. Um, so this quote here, and I'll just read it, um, is from his journals um, from about 1690 to 1696. Um, in, view of their, in view of their having relapsed into apostasy again and as such being traitors to and enemies of our holy faith, I ordered a death sentence carried out against these criminals, the agitators, leaders, captains, and other Indians who caused the people of these nations to leave their pueblos, escaping to the mesas, summits, and cañadas to fortify themselves in those places, and who with them may be safe from this punishment they have so deserved. So here he's talking about um, pueblos who have sought refuge in their mesa top communities after his return um, to New Mexico. Um, so while Vargas um, has been coined the uh, peaceful reconqueror, uh, an oxymoron if I've ever heard one, um, a lot of his own words and actions kind of contradict that peaceful uh, narrative that's been kind of put forth. So this narrative of the bloodless reconquest of New Mexico um, has been challenged in recent years um, by indigenous peoples, um, independent indigenous uh, native led organizations um, who have called for a, an end to the celebration or the glorification of, um, of uh, colonialism, um, reconquest. So what you're seeing here on the right is a picture of uh, an annual, what used to be an annual um, reenactment of Vargas's um, uh, reconquest of New Mexico, which has been coined a peaceful um, uh, reconquest of the region. Um, it's been met in recent years by, with protests by indigenous groups. So here you have a, um, a photo on the left of uh, indigenous people um, protesting in downtown Santa Fe where this event was held annually. Um, this was about three or four years ago where things came to a head during um, one of, during the uh, scheduled um, reenactments of, of the reconquest. Um, there was some arrest, there was some violence and after some debate, after lots of um, kind of discussions both in different forums and venues, um, 
the group Caballeros de, Caballeros de Vargas who um, put on this um, commemorative event uh, eventually dropped the Entrada portion of their um, celebration. So, I mean, uh, it's a contentious issue here. Um, that's, you know, still very kind of hotly debated um, to this day. Um, so these are kind of the, the, the lingering uh, ongoing effects of, of, uh, of this event in, in, the, in New Mexico. So moving to, to my work, um, I, I look at the events during this period from a broader perspective, a landscape perspective. Um, and at the onset of Vargas's reconquest mission, uh, the center of gravity of the Pueblo world of the Pueblo world shifted from mission mission villages, um, which were um, at or near uh, watersheds such as the Rio Grande. Um, a lot of their mission villages had been contaminated through bloodshed, and people sought the protection of um, upland areas um, near their homes. Uh, the deliberate movement to Mesa villages was the result of many different strategies of resistance, as public communicate public communities anticipated the return of the Spaniards. Um, after all, prior to Vargas, there had been several failed attempts to subdue the Pueblos by Antonio Alderman um, and others uh, prior to Vargas. So what characterized the reconquest for the Pueblos was, was not only its violence, but um, the Pueblos' adamant resistance to it. So while the Pueblos made some compromises um, and accommodations, um, and even in some cases made some alliances with Vargas, Resistance was overwhelmingly constant throughout his reconquest. Um, so at the time, three major centers of resistance emerged, um, one surrounding the Cochiti district uh, with the Karis people, another in the Hamas district, uh, of, um, which surrounded over the resistance of the Toa people, Toa speaking people, and in the Tewa district um, here at Tunio at San Alfonso Pueblo where the Tewas, um, coalesce together. So Vargas's reconquest looks like this. Um, after taking ritual possession in 1692, he returned to, to Mexico, uh, presumably to gather more supplies and settlers. Uh, and when he returned to the area, he found the former capital of Santa Fe heavily fortified um, and occupied by Tewa people. Vargas then um, attacks um, the, 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 the former capital um, and he executes uh, Pueblo leaders, publicly executes Pueblo leaders um, within its plaza. Um, after this, there was wholesale movement of uh, Pueblo folks to Mesa top villages. Um, and in 1694, he began his military campaign against the Mesa top villages. In 1696, uh, what is common to, commonly referred to as the Second Pueblo Revolt, um, which was just a continuation of the, um, the, uh, res the Mesa top resistance. Um, this was uh, quickly put down uh, by Vargas because he was a little more prepared at this point. It's important also to note that the revolt of 1680 and the events of the resistance, surrounding the resistance of the reconquest in the mid 1690s was not an isolated event. There's been a long history of resistance to Spanish settler colonialism in the region um, by Pueblos that is still to this day poorly understood. But we do have a ethno-historical record of this resistance, um, which has been compiled here through a series of smaller uprisings and revolts beginning in 1623, all the way through 1696. Um, 1696, however, marks the kind of last major um, kind of violent resistance to Spanish uh, settler colonialism. Again, a different view of Tuño uh, or Black Mesa, um, Cardinal Mesa to the north for the Tewa people, um, this is where the, the focus of my work is centered. So I'll, I'll dive into to the events that surround the, um, the reconquest at Tunio. 
When the rebel enemies of the Tewa nations and their followers uh, discovered us at the base of the Mesa, they gave great war cries, crowding uh, the tops of the Mesa, its Pinoles, and all around it. They said they were awaiting the Hamas, Karis, Kochti, Apache, Zuni, Mokino, and many other nations. They spoke shameful words, which led us to fire a few shots at the people, but the heavy snow did not permit bringing the war in the proper manner. We saw that there was a risk of losing the battle completely because of how fortified the enemy was. So this quote is taken from Vargas's journals, um, and this is kind of his assessment, uh, his initial assessment of the Mesa in February of 1694, where it was um, covered in snow, but yet people were occupying the top of the mesas. And at this point, there was at least nine Tewa Pueblos um, who sought refuge on top of this mesa. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, the groups who were up there. Because of the snow at Tunio, Vargas turned his attention to the other center, one of the other centers of resistance, uh, which was at Old Cochiti or Hana Kotiet. Um, where people from Cochiti, San Marcos, and San Felipe Pueblos had occupied the Mesa after a bloody battle in April of 1694, um, after which 342 women and 13 warriors were captured. Um, he, he, he captured the Mesa um, on April 17th, burned the village, and returned to Santa Fe, where he could refocus his attention to Tunio. And on the right of this picture is the... Um, the remnants of the uh, the Pueblo on top of the Mesa to the left. Turning back to Tunio on March 4th, his first, Vargas's first major offensive took place uh, in which he claims to have captured the Southern portion of the Mesa, um, but he was not able to take the rest of the Mesa because it was protective, protected by a defensive wall, according to his journals. Um, but if you take a look at the top of the Mesa, we see no archeological evidence of a defensive wall. So this is where kind of comparing um, archeology span in the ground to the ethno-historical record can bring up some kind of neat um, comparisons. Um, and you can kind of parse out, you know, what, what may, may be or may not be real about um, uh, these historical accounts. So between uh, later in, in the month of March, he made several futile attempts to take the Mesa. One of his strategies included using Pueblo ladders, which were taken from Santa Clara Pueblo to scale the steepest parts of the Mesa. Um, this was a futile attempt as the Mesa was just too steep and impenetrable. Um, so after this attempt, he again um, returned to to Santa Fe to regather himself. Um, he then turned his attention to Guadalupe Mesa in the Jemez region, uh, which was occupied by Batoa people and some Karis people from Santa Domingo Pueblo. Um, in July of 1694, 84 um, Toa people and Karis people were killed at a battle in which they tried to defend the Mesa. After this event, he turned his attention back to Tunio um, in September of 1694, where he, uh, and this time he gained allies from Zia, Santa Ana, and San Felipe Pueblos, who were all Karis speaking Pueblos. Um, he also um, had allies from Pecos and Jemez Pueblos, both Toa speaking villages. Um, so during these days, Vargas's tactics tactics included, included um, destroying fields on the, uh, in the valley below, uh, cornfields where Pueblo folks um, 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 supplemented themselves. Um, he did this in plain view of the Tewa defenders on top of the Mesa. Um, on September 8th of the same year, negotiations began to take place between uh, Tewa folks on the Mesa and Vargas. Um, and eventually, uh, the Tewa and Vargas and his allies uh, negotiated a peaceful surrender, a peaceful end to the siege um, at the Mesa. So in this way, the, the Mesa at Tunio was never taken by Vargas. 
Um, it's a point of pride for Teva folks that they were able to successfully defend themselves against Vargas, and he was not able to take the Mesa in the same way that he uh, he did at Coach T and Hamas Pueblos. Um, So as I said, there were several attempts at Spanish reconquest prior to Vargas. This is just to, to go back to the um, ongoing um, uh, resistance strategies that Pueblo folks took against Spanish uh, colonial settlers. Um, uh, settlers. Um, and in my work, I take a place-based based approach to understanding this uh, time period. Um, and what I mean by a, a place-based approach is that I emphasize the interdependence of time, space, and history. And my starting, my starting point is uh, the idea that places embody history, both physically and spiritually, and that historical memories are given life when people re-encounter these places. Uh, this place-based perspective is essential for the further development of indigenous archaeology in a couple of ways. Uh, first, uh, this approach embraces the strong link that Pueblo and other indigenous peoples maintain with their past. For Pueblo people, there's no disconnect between place and time. The contemporary world is that and that of their ancestors are embedded in the same place. It is this reality that generates our continuing attachment to these places. Uh, second, a place-based perspective furthers the aims of an indigenous archaeology by reflecting, by rejecting the false dichotomy between history and prehistory and the implicit assumption that these places of history are linked to entangled European indigenous encounters, while places linked, linked exclusively to an indigenous past are part of prehistory. Um, so the, the Cardinal Mesas, um, the Mesas located in the Cardinal directions near villages, Tewa villages are especially venerated. For example, Tunio on the top right of the map there, um, or Black Mesa is located due north of our Pueblo, and it figures prominently in um, many, oh, excuse me, figures prominently in many of our traditions at San Ildefonso, and it is but one place on the cosmological landscape of, of, our, uh, of our people. So while the events that happen there are important, um, it is the place itself and all that it embodies physically and spiritually that holds the highest importance. So my work is an example of an indigenous researcher uh, working with my own community. Um, and it's intended to provide inspiration to other indigenous students who have an interest in pursuing archaeology. Um, by providing insight into the ways in which I have engaged with my own community. I hope to illustrate the successes and pitfalls of my approach. Um, so my choice to do archaeology at the village of Tunio, which is occupied by my own ancestors, provides an opportunity to engage with my own community's history. Um, this also requires me to consider the implications of my research while reflecting upon my own subjectivities. Uh, methodolog methodologically, I'm committed to providing suitable alternative archaeological methods to Indigenous people who may have a vested interest in archaeology but are concerned with the limitations of traditional site-based survey methods and wish to refrain from engaging in invasive archaeological practices. Um, so in my work, I focused on the cartographic documentation of the Mesa. Um, and I use drones or unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles, um, which provided a more culturally appropriate alternative to um, uh, other um, less appropriate uh, methods like excavation or uh, ground surveys. Uh, and this had virtually no physical impact on the heritage, re heritage resources of uh, the Mesa. Um, Aside from being more culturally appropriate, um, it provides a more efficient and precise means of creating um, uh, topographical maps and uh, maps of habitation places. Um, and it should appeal to ar all archaeologists, regardless of their methodological leanings. So the 
project itself, I, I named it the Tunio Research Project. Um, and some of the main goals were to identify and understand uh, the social processes and strategies of resistance surrounding the founding and occupation of Tunio during the Pueblo Revolt period and incorporate archaeology into San Alfonso Pueblo's own understandings of this sacred place uh, within the context of Pueblo Revolt history. Uh, the central focus was to assess the context of the nature of the archaeology um, of the Pueblo Revolt village on top of Tunio, as well as to evaluate uh, the ethnographic and historical data within the context of revolt settlement patterns. Uh, the main component of the archaeological, invas archaeological investigations um, involve the uh, mapping of the Mesa village and its associated defensive features. Um, because there's so much work to do at the Mesa, I, I really wish I could do it all, um, but just given the scope of the dissertation and my research there, I chose to, instead of trying to, to do everything, I chose to do smaller pilot projects for my dissertation, in addition to the main component, which was the mapping. So I, um, I engaged in a, a pilot uh, ceramic um, kind of analysis of, of the Mesa. Um, some of the ceramics you see here are um, what are called uh, Tewa polychrome, which date directly to the um, the Pueblo Revolt period uh, itself uh, in the mid 16, 1690s. I also did a pilot rock art survey where I um, kind of did an informal survey, pilot survey, uh, just like it's called, um, of some of the rock art features um, on and around the Mesa. Uh, so this involved me just uh, hiking around basically. And there's a picture of me on the left. Um, kind of dangerously uh, scaling the edge of a cliff to, to document some, um, some rock art there at, at Tunio. I did a defensive features uh, survey. So what you see here is a, um, a wall fortification, the remnants of a wall fortification on top of the mesa that were constructed um, in an effort to uh, prohibit um, Vargas and his allies from scaling the mesa, and uh, there's an abundance of these of these defensive fortifications um, on and around the mesa. I also did a um, uh, informal survey of ammunition caches, and these ammunition caches, if you look at the picture on the right, are just um, collections or aggregations of um, river rock um, quartz cobbles um, that were used as projectiles against Vargas and his troops. And this quote was taken directly from Vargas's journals where he directly references uh, the use of these stones um, where he says the danger to the men of being killed was great because this place is so impregnable. The Mesa was completely, completely rocky and covered with boulders and the enemy so well prepared that they had many rocks from the river to bombard us hurling them with slings. So that's kind of an interesting, kind of neat comparison of the ethnohistoric record uh, with the archeology. span So what I did in my work was create kind of visuals, um, maps that uh, helped me interpret the, um, the lay of the land, if you will. Um, this map shows the distribution of these uh, types of defensive features um, many of the defensive features occur only um, on the most accessible portions of the Mesa. So if you take a look at the green lines, they represent trails. Um, and these are parts of the Mesa where the topography allows for uh, human access or foot access to the Mesa. So on the left of the Mesa, where you have that very steep topography against the river, there's no need to create fortifications there because the mesa is naturally defended by a 80 foot cliff. Um, so I found this distribution to be um, kind of cool and very telling um, of the, the military strategy that um, Tewa folks were engaged with. And this is just a close up of those features um, at Tunio, uh, some of the fortifications and the ammunition caches. Um, 
so for the last phase of, of this research, I partnered with um, Archeo Geophysical uh, Associates, uh, Chet Walker and Mark Willis, who are really awesome, who are pioneers really in um, the mapping of archeological sites and features uh, with drones. Uh, they do work all over the world. And I was fortunate enough to have them come work with me because I'm not smart enough or capable enough to operate drones myself. So I outsource some of my work. Um, so any of you grad students out there, um, outsource your stuff. It's uh, as long as you get approval from your, your advisors. Um, these guys are really awesome. They, they came in and um, did work in ways that, that I couldn't. And um, I, owe them, I owe them tons. Um, so that's a picture of one of the drones that they, they flew over the Mesa. Um, here's some of the methods we used. Um, so data acquisition was accomplished through a digital process called photogrammetry. Um, so the drones were set on a specific path. Uh, so the, the alignments there of circles you see is the path of the drones. Each one of the circles represents a uh, photo that was taken while the, the drone was in flight. Um, all these photos were stitched together like a quilt. Uh, geo-referenced um, uh, with targets on the ground. This is where their, the Mark and Chet's expertise comes in. And with this data, um, they were able to create really cool um, hillshade relief maps um, that really brought out the topography of the ruined um, settlement on top of the Mesa. So if you look at the kind of dimpled surface of the um, of the mesa there, these in these high resolution images, um, we we can the the architecture and this is architecture that we're seeing um, it begins to really pop out. So it's it's very different from um, a lot of the other um, uh, revolt era sites um, in the region. Uh, I showed you a picture of, uh, of the remnants of the village at Kochiti, where you have masonry walls that are in some cases still standing. Here, the, the topography doesn't allow for that type of architecture um, to, be, to be built. Um, so instead, you have a kind of unique um, form of architecture on top of the mesa. This was my kind of best estimation of what this uh, looks like um, each of these kind of polygons represents a pit structure of some sort, um, which I presume were used as a habitation spaces. Um, so unlike masonry architecture, which leaves a very clear material signature later in the form of standing walls, um, what we have on top of Tunio is a lot different. Um, so this informal construction or architectural type uh, may be consistent with the fact that uh, the move to Tunio happened very quickly and involved multiple social groups from different pueblos in response to Vargas's military campaign. Um, and there's no historical descriptions of the Mesa itself or its architecture because Vargas never made it to, to here. Um, and so parsing all of this out was um, was was like really interesting. And while I'm still for the dissertation, I, I did what I could as far as interpreting the uh, the architecture here. There's still lots to be lots to be analyzed uh, with this data, and there's so much more to do. Um, here's just a close up of uh, of, of some of that. Um, that kind of topography that was created with the, uh, the drone imagery. Um, and when I talk about broadening indigenous archeology, span um, what, what I hope to do with this work is provide kind of new avenues for archeological research that uh, aren't kind of rooted in the colonial, um, colonial foundations of a, of a Western uh, traditional, traditionally, traditionally practice archaeology. I, I really hope to present um, new perspectives, new ways of understanding, 
Um, and I continue to do this uh, with, with some of the work I'm proposing uh, for Tunio. I had hoped to talk more about um, an oral history project that um, we propose with the National Park Service, um, but we didn't get funded for that program. And so we're reformulating our, um, our proposal to make it more attractive to the funders at the Park Service. So what I hope to do in this next phase of work with anthropological research, uh, 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 a firm uh, based in Tucson, Arizona, is to collect um, uh, oral histories and more ethnographic information about the Mesa from our own people. Um, because as it is in many indigenous communities, um, especially with the onset of the, of the COVID pandemic, um, we're beginning to lose elders and with them, a lot of these stories go with them. So the next component uh, is heavily focused on um, ethnography and collecting oral histories in the Pueblo um, as they relate to Tunio. Um, and I hope to combine this with some of the previous work I did on the archaeology of Tunio and just create new narratives that challenge um, outdated ones rooted in um, colonial histories. Um, so if I went a little bit over, I apologize, but I, I have some time or if, if there is some time, I'll be happy to take some questions. Um, uh, thank you for your, for your time this afternoon. Thanks very much. Interesting talk. So uh, yes, please uh, post your questions or comments in the chat, or we can um, also have you ask them directly. You can raise your hand in the Zoom and, and ask them directly. I see a question here from uh, Clint Lightfoot. Uh, He says, many thanks for your great talk in your tunia research and your mapping of the habitation pits. Um, um, on top of the mesa, did you find very many material remains near or uh, in the pits? Yeah, on, on top of the mesa itself, there weren't very many um artifacts uh, that we observed. Again, I didn't, I didn't do a 100% survey, but just based on uh, my informal surveys, there's not a whole lot up there. Um, and this could be because folks just didn't take very much up there. Um, or it could be because of the tumultuous period that surrounded the occupation of the Mesa. Um, there just wasn't a whole lot. Uh, to be found in, in the aftermath of, of war. Um, that's really what it comes down to. This is a, it's a battlefield. Um, and it's a unique battlefield because the, the battle didn't happen on an even kind of plane. It, it happened vertically. Um, so I have a lot of investigations to do like on the slopes, the talus slopes. Um, but as far as the top of the Mesa, there, there wasn't a lot of fighting that happened on top of the Mesa, but rather on the slopes themselves. Mm -hmm. I see a question here from June Sinceri. June, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, just just in case my uh, connection's been spotty. Hey, thank you for that excellent talk, sir. Appreciate it. Um, man, thank those are super sweet drone maps. Very impressive. And um, having you know been asked by a couple of community partners to to help them. Um, demonstrate some of the kinds of, of, of um, things that are threatening their heritage sites, including lots of erosion from cattle that the Forest Service is running on the site or things like that. Um, I was wondering if some of those fantastic maps you have, you did a like a before, you had, when did you take those uh, shots with the drone? What, what year was that? That was back in 20, shoot, 16, 17, no, 18 maybe. I forget. It's been so long ago. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I mean, I did, I did shots in Mali in like 2012, and I'm still trying to follow up. But, but like the um, the idea that now there's been a few monsoon seasons, some rains, and things like that. Is it is it a priority of San Defonso to kind of think about what erosion impacts are 
um, you know, on, on the site now, uh, like, like it is for some of my community partners who want to negotiate how to protect the site, one of the first questions is, well, what do you want to do to protect it? And, and they, they want to use some of these kinds of uh, three-dimensional topo topographic models to demonstrate how erosion is affecting it, their, their site. You know, like it's, it's head cutting these little arroyos into the site and it's causing damage to the adobe or, or maybe it's deflating the site through some other measures. And um, they want to demonstrate that their archaeological partnership um, is generating some data that they can use in those negotiations. So they, you know, having us go back up there and do another three-dimensional topographic map we can do like a comparative volumetric and I'm still working that jazz out. And I was kind of thinking, man, here's a guy who's got some pretty, pretty rad data, you know, up on the, on, on your, on your Mesa. And it might be cool to see what, you know, or has that, has that been expressed to you as a priority for, for Samuel Defonso to do that kind of thing? It, it hasn't been expressed as a priority. And, and this is why it, our, our philosophy on preservation is not a, um, a standard Western one. So we're not necessarily concerned with preserving a site for preservation's sake. Um, if, if a site is eroding or is being um, uh, affect, being affected by kind of natural processes, um, that's, the, that's the natural kind of course that some of these places take. And it's, it's not our place to artificially preserve them where they're not meant to be preserved in that way. So that's uh, the, our preservation philosophy might be a little different from, from maybe the groups that you work with, <clears throat> but drones certainly are a really good way to, to document um, uh, these, these changes over time, because you, you can, you can get to the very fine details of like um, soil volumes and, and rock displacements and things like that with this type of data. Um, so I, I could put you in touch with these guys who, who do this work, uh, you, unless you know them already. No, no, I don't. Thank you. I, I might, I would appreciate that. Thanks. Because yeah, I mean, it sounds like with the natural processes, that's something that also uh, Grayton has talked about how that's returning back to the, to the, to the world and the way it's meant to be. I think that the community partners that I work with are, that are concerned about like overgrazing that's being allowed by the forest service is they don't you know yeah. that's a little different than like just rainstorms sure. and things like that but sure. um, yeah for sure i mean i'm i'm very interested in, in providing that uh, as a service to those those communities who invited me so um yeah you know you if you could hook me up i'd appreciate it sir yeah we'll chat all right thank you sir uh, do you have any other questions or comments Is there one more question, Nico, in the chat? Uh, see, there's one from June. Ah, yeah, Dr. Hadith Norwich. Uh, thank you for your great talk, Dr. I'd be like, oh, you're here. Uh, would you like to ask it? Yeah, just uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Aguilar. That was a great talk. I was just wondering about that um, Tewa polychrome that you showed us. Um, like, where did that come from if it's not from up on uh, Mesa? And um, how is that related to your um, uh, studies of a kind of revolt period activities in the area? Yeah, that, that wasn't from the, from the Mesa itself. Um, I think that pot is from the School for Advanced Research Collections or the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. Um, but I just use it as a representation of Tewa polychrome, which is the most abundant uh, form on top of the mesa. Um, so it, it dates directly to this time period of 1690s during the reconquest. So I just use it as a as an example to illustrate um, its abundance there. Any other questions or comments? I wanted to mention I've worked with Mark Willis and, and he's a terrific, really imaginative uh, guy with the drone yeah. machine and also with petroglyphs with different kinds of illumination. Really like yeah, them. they're they're pretty innovative folks who who can map almost anything. <laughs> yeah. Very nice to see pictures from the other side. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. We have another comment. 
a question here. We can read it uh, from Julia Frankenbach. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Aguilar. I was struck by your description of your place-based approach. Do you have any readings or other resources you would recommend on place-based approaches specifically for folks working on indigenous history? Uh, sure. I, uh, my my discussions of um, the my my place-based approach approach um, are published in in a, in a volume. I'm looking at my bookshelf now. I, I think it's called The Death of Prehistory. I can send a link to, to the folks at Berkeley and they could maybe distribute it to the um, to the folks on, on the call here. Um, but I go into this uh, into length, in, into a lengthy discussion about that approach. Um, and so, yeah, my, my work is is out there in different places and um, wish we had more time to talk about that approach, but I can, I can definitely forward on some uh, places where, I, where this stuff can be found. That would be awesome. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar. Of course. I can put these in the description on the video that we'll be sharing from this, from this talk. Are there any other questions? All right, well, thanks very much, Dr. Aguilar. Very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. We'll talk soon. Okay, guys. Um, appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Before we go, I wanted to mention that our brown bag next week is with a panel from the San Francisco State Global Museum, and it's on the subject of removing removing collector names from museum legacy collections. Um, so that should be a fascinating discussion. So please join us next week. Thank you. Thanks again. All right.